This is the first of a number of programs we have lined up this year on issues to do with uh, the language of instruction in the classroom at all levels. As most of you are aware, our work in English language teacher development is quite extensive across India. Since 2007, we have worked with 11 state governments in India and have reached over 800,000 teachers. We have complemented our work in teacher development projects by working with policymakers and thought leaders in education, language teaching and development through policy dialogues, think tank initiatives, conferences, panel discussions, debates and bringing out a number of publications. Some of our research publications in English are displayed on the table where you registered and all of them are available free for download on our websites and I have shared some of these website details here so you can note them down and access them later. We have also instituted English language teaching research partnership awards and I do see some members in the audience who have received the ELTRP awards. We've also started to put our work, um, put together a very comprehensive online fully searchable database of all ELT research across India. This project is ongoing and on the left hand side, uh, on the right hand side of that slide you can see the screenshot of that research website where all the research is listed. We have also um, been working with uh, the English and Foreign Languages University of India in Hyderabad since 2011 and very quickly in the last few years the English Language Teacher Edu Educators Conference that we host in partnership with the EFLU also called TECH it has become one of the world's largest English language teacher educators conference. As I mentioned right at the start, this series of lectures by Professor Curtis is the first in a range of programs that we have lined up on the theme of languages in the, cl languages in the classroom. The rich evidence and multiple perspectives we hope to collect and document through these events will contribute to the language and development conference that the British Council will be hosting in autumn of 2015. Welcome to what seems uh, to be uh, an exciting discussion on English medium instruction, boon or curse. And uh, we all probably have an opinion on this, as do the academics. Why are we doing this? Devanjan has explained the context of our work. We've been working with state governments and with uh, various kinds of schools, both uh, uh, English medium, uh, and uh, state schools where the language of instruction is the mother tongue and we have responded to the unique demands of each of these uh, schools or uh, governments or uh, uh, organizations and uh, to do this we have to understand what goes on in the classroom and what works and what doesn't work and there are of course varied viewpoints about uh, the teaching of English uh, by academics and by all of us so that's why this is uh, probably is going to be an exciting discussion. And uh, we know that there are two uh, different kinds of opinions, quite contrary, oper operating uh, at the moment uh, in the country, and we can't deny uh, either of them. Uh, there's a one, there's a groundswell of demand for English at the grassroots level in almost every state in India, particularly among the socially and economically marginalized. And NCRD's data shows 25 of India's 28 states teach English from class one. And all states introduce English at some stage or the other. Okay. And uh, reports of, by Pratham and Probe indicate that an ever increasing number of parents are choosing to put their children in fee paying private English medium schools rather than the government schools. That's one scenario. And the other scenario at the same time, studies also indicate that there is no manifest difference in learning outcomes between unrecognized private English medium schools and government schools. And studies also show that instruction in mother tongue in early years of literacy is the bedrock of good learning outcomes. Okay. And there's also a misplaced notion in many quarters that an argument for English in public education systems is an argument against other languages. 
but that is not the case. The British Council advocates a robust multilingual curriculum in public education and recognizes the need for mother tongue based uh, instruction in the early years of schooling. At the same time, there's a strong demand for English uh, in the employment context in India, particularly in ever-expanding urban areas, and that demand is not restricted only to the elite. Our research shows that there are three major drivers for the demand of English, education, employment, and social mobility. And this research was done by David Gredall. Many of you are familiar uh, with uh, the work that he has done, English Next India, and that these three are reasons that no policymaker in India can ignore education, employment, and social mobility. Okay. The National Vocational Education Qualifications Framework in, in, in India recognizes English as a key skill in many sectors, as over 50% of the 20 odd skills focus areas. So, English is also a skill like hospitality, tourism, IT enabled services, health management, etc. Okay. English is not the language of a few Anglophone countries where it's the uh, native language. It never was. Over 70% of English language communications in the world takes place between non-native speakers of English. Again, something that David Gredall has done uh, and shown in his research on the future of English in 1990. And the story of English language in India is one of give and take. Hindi has contributed to one of the highest number of loan words in English from a non-European language. Where would English be without words such as shampoo, pandit, pakka, jodhpurs, and so many other words? Okay. And uh, there's also uh, a view now, this morning itself, uh, uh, I was told by uh, the aunt of Kumara Mangalam Villa that my nephew has just written an essay in a book called Reimagining India which I haven't read yet, but I'd like to read, where he says, I used to first recruit people uh, in my organization, and this is uh, the big Billa Empire, who could speak fluently in English. But I have realized now that there are a lot of people who don't speak fluently in English, but who can do the job very well in my organization. So I'm looking at this whole thing from a diff different perspective. So there are all these new ideas emerging in uh, the, uh, you know, the English language, teaching, learning, training scenario in India, with a lot of views by everybody. Uh, and there is also the, uh, the, uh, the integration of English into Hindi and Bangla and our old languages. I look at a song like Kolavari D. I mean, it uses Tamil and it uses, uh, you know, uh, English in just whatever way they want. And it's got several million hits. And you also see how uh, newspapers use their uh, headings uh, with, uh, you know, uh, a very good integration of Hindi and English. And you see how many of these television channels, uh, uh, you know, speak in a language which is neither Hindi nor English, but they get across to us. So all of that is happening now. And we are doing this discussion discussion in that context. Uh, I'd like to introduce the speakers uh, for today. Andy Curtis is professor in the School of Graduate Education at Anaheim University, California, and the president of TESOL International. He received his MA in Applied Linguistics and Language Teaching and his PhD in International Education, both from the University of York in England. He has published around 100 articles, book chapters, and books, and presented to around 25,000 teachers in 50 countries. Dr. Curtis works as an independent consultant for language teaching organizations worldwide. Welcome, uh, Professor Andy Curtis. We also have with us in the panel, as a respondent, Professor Anuradha Loya, and uh, she's much in the uh, media these days. I won't embarrass her by talking about that anymore. But anyway, uh, we are proud to have her with us here. She's the Vice Chancellor of Presidency University, Kolkata. She's a molecular parasitologist who has done extensive research in the field of infectious disease. She's a senior professor and past chairperson of the Department of Biochemistry at the Bose Institute in Kolkata. Previously, she served as the founding CEO of the UK-India Collaborative Welcome Trust, DBT India Alliance, an organization that supports excellence in medical research. She received the National Award for Young Women Scientists from the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and several awards from other agencies. And it's uh, very good to have her because she will give her perspective from a scientist's point of view and the English language and what it does. 
this is Devi Kaur. Uh, again, all of us know her uh, uh, as an educationist and uh, for her recent excellent articles uh, in the media for her uh, you know, views, which are uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, something that we all need to ponder over the whole day once you've read her article. Uh, she has been in the field of school education for over 40 years. She's currently director and secretary of Modern High School for Girls, Kolkata, and director and board member of Modern Academy of Continuing Education, which is called MACE. She's a member, Education Task Force, Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also that of the Round Table on School Education constituted in September 2009 by the Ministry of Human Resources Development, Government of India, to discuss innovative ideas to improve school education in India, especially with regard to public-private partnership and she served as an expert on several national and international institutions such as quality education study undertaken by Wipro and educational initiatives, Calcutta School of Music, Parthavavan, Vishwabharati, Mahindra Mahindra, Ford Foundation. She, she has several publications to her name and writes regularly on educational topics in leading newspapers and journals. And Rajiv Bakshi, may I say our own from the British Council, he is teacher, teacher educator and coordinator, having started his teaching career in 1992. He graduated from university in the UK in 1988 and has recently completed the International House Certificate in ELT Management. He has worked in a number of countries, including the UK, Mexico, from where he's come recently, uh, Sri Lanka, Vietnam and Australia. He is now the academic manager for the Kolkata Teaching Center of the British Council. Welcome to all of you, and I'd like to ask Professor Andy Curtis to kick off with his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Namaste, and welcome to this afternoon's talk. It is a great pleasure for me to be here. I am very fortunate in that I get to travel all over the world, but coming to India is always a particular experience for me, uh, in many ways more difficult and more challenging than the other countries I go to, but also more meaningful and more impactful. So I did want to give you an overview and to thank the British Council for the opportunity to come back to India. I will talk for about 30 minutes. I've noticed over the years that I learn more when I listen and not so much when I talk. So I will talk less and listen more. I've been asked to keep my comments to 30 minutes. So we will be going at quite a pace. So please don't feel you need to take too many notes from the slides. I, the British Council here will have a copy of the slides. So this is an overview of what I'd like to do in the next half an hour. Firstly, to give you a little personal professional background, because I believe the relationships between language and culture and identity are extremely important. How we see ourselves is largely a function of where we've come from and the languages we speak. So I'll start briefly with some personal professional background and then look at some of the historical and political factors of English as a medium of instruction. As we know historically and politically, that knowledge is power. And you cannot express knowledge without language. Therefore, language is power. So these are highly political and historical factors. I'll look at some research coming up to date, including research this year just published, and some research done a few days ago, and conclude with a glimpse, glimpse at the future as I said, I'll keep my comments to half an hour, so, um, but my goal is to try and give uh, food for thought. I am not particularly, I don't have a vested interest in promoting EMI, nor do I have a vested interest in uh, opposing EMI. I like the title um, of the talk, English Medium Instruction, Boon or Curse. It could be both, it could be neither. So my goal is to provide some food for thought without necessarily taking a position either way. A little bit of background, as we heard from one of our panelists, I actually started in clinical medical biochemistry, obstetrics, gynecology, and pediatrics, and then moved, made the move, which seemed like a good idea at the time, the move from medical science to English language teaching. So I come from 
a Western scientific paradigm. But having come from the biological sciences, for me, language is a living, breathing entity. All of the characteristics, all of the things that make a living thing living also apply to language. So those were some of my earliest research, looking at language as a living, breathing entity and language classrooms as very dynamic, organic entities. Also, uh, having spent quite a bit of time in the local traffic here, I've been reminded of my work on chaos and complexity, which comes out, <laughs> which comes out of my scientific background, but I've applied to language classrooms and more recently to traffic patterns, partly because the notion of the relationship between cause and effect. There is not a linear relationship between what we teach and what is learned. It is a much more interested, much more complicated organic relationship. If, every, if all our students learned everything we taught, life would be a lot easier. So the relationship between cause and effect in my work looks at chaos and complexity, which, as I've said, is a recurring theme in the traffic here. Uh, because my background is relevant, I do take a couple of minutes to talk about my background. In 1981, I was born and raised in England. In 1981, a census survey came around. You're probably too young for the... Rajiv's probably too young for the 1981 census, but I was there for the 1981 census in the UK, and you had to describe your ethnic origins in as much detail as possible, and there was a small line to do it. So I was 18, I had a lot of time, I took a couple of weeks, and I wrote down this as the one-sentence description of my origin, which, as you can see, I'm assuming you can see at the back. Can you see at the back? Okay. First-generation, post-colonial, Anglo-Indo-Afro-Caribbean Pacific offspring. And they sent the form back, <laughs> which I still have, because this, this was a moment for me where they said, they just wrote on the form, no, <laughs> which I thought was great. <laughs> they didn't say no which particular bit, so I called them and they said, no, you can't be that. So I had to tick the box, other, instead. <laughs> And my first published poems were under the title of Other, because this has been a recurring theme. So notions of identity came early to me, though I was born and raised in England. My parents and grandparents are from British Guyana, from South America. People don't usually expect me to be South American. And before that, and the next stop, which I've never been to, is uh, going to be Patna Bihar. And it seems increasingly likely that that's where the British Empire, rather ironically, given the talk today, uh, are most likely to have been kidnapped and enslaved on the sugar canes of British Guyana, Georgetown. My father's family name was this, Sukdeo. My mother's family name was Sukram and also Prasad. Uh, I am not Andy Curtis. Andy Curtis is a legal fiction that was created when I was 18 years old. Because the Commission for Racial Equality did a big survey that year, and they created 100 fake resumes with identical qualifications. 50 of them had obviously foreign names. 50 of them had Smith, Jones, and Brown, and so on. Of the 50 identical resumes with British names, 87% were invited to interview. Of the 50 that were obviously foreign, 7% were invited to interview. So I changed the name, which is another story, and every single interview I went to in England, people commented on what a nice family name I had, by which they meant not expected. I've written uh, a number of uh, works on these uh, themes, one is a, a collection called Shades of Meaning, which is uh, some of my early experiences uh, based on that history. Most recently, a couple of days ago, I was in Dakar at a conference at the University of Liberal Arts in Bangladesh. And the most interesting thing there was a very lively British Council signature session on EMI in uh, Bangladesh, which got very heated and so I'm hoping today that we will be able to generate some of that 
heat here. So it's obviously a very important topic, but that was just a few days ago. We came in from Dakar last night. So a few points, as I said, my goal is to be controversial without being uh, offensive, if possible. So EMI, English Medium Instruction, what's interesting is the lack of prepositions for me as a grammar teacher. Well, English as the medium of instruction, which implies a definite article singularity, versus English as a medium of instruction, which implies a more uh, indefinite plurality. So these phrases with my name in a part of the, the research and writing that I'm doing now. So when we hear from the panel and when we hear from you, do feel free to pick up on any of these points. Because I, I was looking for the preposition in the title, realized there isn't one the way it's used now, and then looked at these. So it's also notions of partiality and completeness. When we say English as a medium of instruction, do we mean 1%? Or do we mean 100%? So partiality or completeness, definite, indefinite, singularity, and plurality. And in my own work, um, I've made this distinction between English as a medium of inclusion or English as a medium of intrusion. So this is partly ac academic wordplay. This is what academics do when they're on very long flights and they should be marking papers. But it also... Looking through those notes, uh, it took 30 hours to get from where I live to, to Dakar. So I had a lot of time to play with these ideas, and these are some of the things that came out. Related to that, I did want to mention just briefly terminology, because a lot of this stuff gets mixed up. Um, although I do love the works of William Shakespeare, I, I am inclined to disagree with some of his comments, uh, one of which is, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. No, I'm afraid not. What we call things affects how they smell. How we name things. As language teachers, we know that language is not neutral. We know that language is power. So how we, what we call things is very important. Whether we call it content-based instruction, whether we call it content-language-integrated learning, is not quite the same thing. So I find a lot of these terminologies conflated, and some of my work is looking at how you unpack those terms and what they mean. One of the things I'm very interested in terms of EMI is whether it's learning language through content or whether it's learning content through language. And again, this may seem like a, a, an academic thing to do on a plane, but they're not the same thing partly to do with what I call the continuum of complementarity, by which I mean, are we primarily focused on the students learning the language, or are we primarily focused on them learning content? Now, ideally, we'd like them to learn both, but there's a real danger that they will learn neither. I'm assuming you know who said this. His name is on this building uh, there's a big plaque, which you may not have noticed as we walked in, and this guy's name is on there, which is just great. So, who said this? The famous Macaulay Minutes, probably the most quoted piece of civil service documentation in the history of the empire. So I was thrilled to see his name on the plaque. I'm going to be photographed by it later. 1835, the infamous Minute on in Indian Education which is where I believe this started in some ways 180 years ago. Let me ask, though, I always assume that everybody, especially in this country, knows this, but how many people here have not seen this Macaulay Minute before? Everybody's seen it. Ah, oh, a couple of people. Because I'm finding it's worth mentioning it, because there's usually at least a couple of people in the audience for whom this is new. So I do start with this, because this idea of people who are Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, opinions, morals, and intellect, is a part of my work and a part of my history and a part of who I am and what I do and why I do it the ways I do it. So T.B. Macaulay started this debate about 180 years ago. David Graddle was mentioned earlier. I'm a big fan of the work of David Graddle, and one of the great things about 
the British Council, I think, is they make this kind of work available freely on their website. So if you're interested in this, um, I would strongly recommend, if you haven't read it, that you have a look at it. It is available, 2010. And let me ask, uh, how many people are, have read this or familiar with the Gradle report? Okay, good. Again, usually not so many. But that document is an attempt to capture what you do, what English teachers do every day in the classroom. It's a few years old now, but it's still, a very for me, a very relevant document which shapes our discussion and our interaction this afternoon. So another historical question for you. Many of you are still too young to remember this. Who said this and when? Pandit um, Nehru. A very famous quote, and it was quoted by the um, editor, uh, the... the uh, respondent in the British Council Journal, who was the Vice-Chancellor of the uh, EFL University in Hyderabad. So he talks about this quote from Nehru and this idea of a class of people who knew English, a kind of English-knowing caste in India. Because for me, having been born and raised in England, I was raised in the British caste system. Because my understanding of how British class works is not that different to the way of caste systems. So I've had some interesting discussions with people about caste and class in England and elsewhere. And how English is a part of that system. Another quote. This was a speech that he gave at a university. And as you can see, he said, I'm hoping this university will see to it that the youths who come to it will receive their instruction through the medium of their vernaculars. Anyone? No? He also talked about what's come to be known as the thousand lost years. He calculated that Indian youth receiving knowledge through English lost about six years of their life. Mahatma Gandhi said this. So this has been a very long debate. It may seem new to those of you who are young, but I promise you, it has a very long history, <laughs> with no sign of being resolved any time soon, I'm happy to say. Um, to come to more recent work, uh, people may be familiar with this journal, which is, most of which is online now, Language in India, and a recent article, not a recent article, an article from 2001 that talked about the continuing battle, and as you can see, this is about 13 years ago, so the uh, writer, K. Ramasam, hearkened back to the day the founding fathers of the Constitution with Independence Day approaching. That seemed relevant. So they're talking about the complexity of the situation here in India, the political, cultural, demographic, social, and geographical situation, and how English fits into that and is shaped by that. And one of the things that I think is going to come up very strongly in the panel responses and in your questions and comments is the question of age in relation to medium of instruction and mother tongue instruction. How early or late it should happen, if it should happen at all, what happens when it happens very early. I found um, this is part of David Gradle's work. I also did some work related to this. In 2009, the Indian television channel, CNN, IBN, did a state of the nation, and they asked people how they felt uh, about English. And these are some of the results. 87% felt that it was important to know English to succeed. 54% felt that those who could speak fluent English are superior. 54%, which is... Still the majority, but a very different percentage as time has gone on. But definitely an ambivalence in the data. You can see there that 82% uh, felt that state language was very important, but 57% felt that it was having a negative impact on first language, on mother tongue instruction, particularly at very young learner ages. Andy Kirkpatrick, a colleague of mine, has done some very compelling work that demonstrates that if the first language literacy is not strongly enough established in the learner, then an attempt to overlay second language literacy too soon will do damage to both. So age 
is very important. 63% felt that jobs should be reserved for those who spoke the state language. So again, from David Gradle's work and others, uh, one, of the many, uh, one of the many things I like about coming to India is how my uh, English improves when I come, because there are all these expressions in Indian English that you may not realize are only used in Indian English. So my English constantly is expanding. So this notion of a library language has become part of my language, but I learned it when I was here and people were talking about English as a library language, a linked language, a language of enslavement, liberation, liberalism, modernity, and development. So English represents a lot of different things to a lot of different people. English as agent of oppression versus English as agent of liberation. The vehicular, we talk about vernacular, but David Gradle talks about the vehicular language. Um, and this notion that David Gradle mentions in his work of the new Brahmins and how English fits into that. He looked at different trends, and as I said, this was from 2010, and India is changing all the time, so even in the four years since then, these numbers have changed, and governmental language policy, as we know, keeps changing. It was mentioned earlier. And Gradle mentions that in the last 10 years, many countries have invested in English language teaching. So one of the interesting things for me, as a native speaker of English, is that the notion of the native speaker norm is now a contradiction in terms. As Director Sen mentioned earlier from David Gradle's work, 75% of all the English produced in the world today was between two non-native speakers, which means that only 25% of, of the English produced in the world today was from people like myself. So we can no longer talk of the native speaker norm in English because the native speaker is a significant minority when it comes to English. In fact, some of my students in China recently described the native speaker as an endangered species, which was nice. And I asked them about it, and what they meant was, which was interesting, the monolingual native speaker of English is a dinosaur, is of little use anymore. So... Interesting things are, are happening there. Uh, the Times of India, I think still a very important newspaper here, ran a, a number of articles, including this one that I came across by T.K. Arun, who said um, that Indians need to be multilingual, and they can be, but in a manner that doesn't kill off Indian languages and children's ability to comprehend or even kill off English itself. He, he wrote that he's all for English for Indians across the board, but he had very mixed feelings about it being a medium of instruction in schools, especially at the younger years, with earlier years of schooling. The mother tongue first. As I mentioned, Andy Kirkpatrick's work about the establishing of first language literacy. It's interesting that many of the countries I go to, many of the governments are introducing English earlier and earlier and earlier at a younger and younger and younger age. Now, as far as I know, but I would be happy to hear from anybody, as far as I know, there is not a single empirical study anywhere in the world yet published that shows that earlier is better. It's an assumption that earlier is better, but I know of no data to support that hypothesis. And we're now starting to see data that might imply too early it may be damaging. Timing is, is very important, it seems, here. So another recent article talked about um, English in relation to caste systems. Last year, in January, I spent several weeks in Tamil Nadu working with the Dalit community. And as some of you may know, English is being very vigorously embraced by the Dalit community for various political and social and economic reasons. So that was a very interesting experience for me working in the Dalit community, looking at what English means to them. And uh, in this paper, they talk about these divisions between public and private education. Having just come 
this is the paper, if you're interested. It's online. Uh, anybody with an internet connection can get it. But the interesting thing, having come from Bangladesh yesterday, was that there are about 120 universities in Bangladesh now. About 40 of them are state or public. About 80 of them are private. So that alone is interesting. Twice as many private universities as there are public. English is taught as the medium of instruction in the 80 private universities. Bangla is the medium of instruction in the 40 state universities. Not 100%, but they were very, very clear. If you go to a state university, you speak the local language. You're taught in it, and that's the language you develop as your strength. If you go to one of the double the number of uh, private universities, then English is the medium of instruction at the tertiary level, almost across the board. So a very interesting division which may come up in some of your questions and comments and the panel's response. So part of that uh, research paper that was looking at English in relation to the different class systems and caste systems historically and currently in relation to private and public access. The British Council blog, which I'm assuming everybody has read, recently asked the question, should English be used as a university's language of instruction in a non-English speaking country? The blog is up there, so again, I would encourage you to have a look at that. There's the, the website. And they gave a, a definition of EMI, the process of teaching a subject through the medium of English in an environment where English is not the first language. And they're finding very conflicting data. So they, they gathered some data from a private university in China, and the students there, as you can see, felt that they, they didn't understand all of the content, but they felt it was a good trade-off because of the development of their language skills. Because my wife and son are Chinese, they're from Beijing, we spend a lot of time in China, so I've been doing a lot of work comparing English in the classroom in India and in China, as they are the two largest populations in the world. So, uh, and also looking at the situation in African countries. As you probably know, every other person in the world now is Indian or Chinese or African. Every other person in the world is either Indian, African or Chinese. One in two belongs to one of those three countries. Now, you don't see that where I live in Canada. A lot of places you don't see that. But that, for me, was a startling statistic, a simple statistic. Half the world's population is in one of those three areas. I believe the implications for language are profound and enormous, thinking of our children's future, if not our own. So, in China, yes, EMI was a good thing. In Croatia, no. There are a lot of complaints that they didn't get the language and they didn't get the content either. So, this from the British Council website, which I encourage you to look at if you're interested in, in this topic. It was a very good discussion. Found that there's a number of challenges, which I hope will come up with the panel and from your questions. Language and identity, which is a very important part. When I explain to people my background, born and raised in England, two generations in South America, before that in India, people will say to me, so what are you? They won't ask me, interestingly, who are you? They will ask me, what are you? So I will answer, well, it depends. And they say, well, what do you mean it depends? I said, well, when I'm in English, in England, I'm an Englishman. When I'm in Canada, I'm Canadian. When I'm in India, I'm an Indian. And when I'm in China, I'm a Chinaman. And they were so angry. It was interesting. Audience members got up, like the British census in 1981, and said, no, you cannot be that. So people's responses to who they are in relation to the language they identify with is no small matter. They did a, a nice study many years ago in England with very fluent native speakers of English learning French and Spanish. And no matter how good their French got or their Spanish got, they kept making mistakes. So they would teach them again. 
test their French, test their Spanish, teach them, test it again, they kept making mistakes as native speakers of English speaking Spanish and French. Why was that happening? Why do you think that, that was happening? Some people suggested it the notion of fossilization. There were some fairly elaborate theories. And then somebody had the idea to go and ask them, why do you keep making mistakes? And they said, oh, we do it, we do it deliberately because we don't want people to think we're French. We would hate to be mistaken for a Spaniard. God forbid. So they kept the mistakes in there to show that they were very, very good speakers of Spanish, but they were not Spanish people. <laughs> a subtle but extremely important distinction. For me, uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in Spain, and when my Spanish occasionally gets good enough to be mistaken for a local, that's the height of my achievement. There is no Spanish language test that is a better test for me than when occasionally somebody will mistake me for being a Spaniard, uh, for being a local Spanish-speaking person, and usually a peasant. Because my skin color is a lot darker than the wealthy Mexicans of Mexico City, I am assumed to be a Mexican peasant, which is fine with me. I, rather, I think that's rather romantic. Because I'm assumed to work outside all day, which is why my skin is so much darker. Now, we, we won't go into that, but skin color and shade in my book, Shades of Meaning, you can have a look at that if you're interested in another aspect of who we are and language and cultural identity in relation to um, not just race and color, but the particular shade of color is important. My African-American friends make huge distinction between degrees of blackness. In conclusion, I'll talk briefly about uh, this paper, which may not seem to have an obvious reference, but it does. It's by uh, Yuko Goto Butler, who was looking at content-based instruction and task-based learning and teaching in the Asia-Pacific region, mostly Southeast um, Asia. She wasn't looking at India at all, but I, I was really struck by how many of her comments resonated with what I think I understand about the situation here. So when she refers to CLT and TBLT, I was kind of reading EMI. So she pointed out that there's a strong promotion of EMI or CLT or task-based, but she found a number of constraints. So within our discussion of whether uh, EMI is a boon or a curse, I wanted us to consider these constraints. And by the way, uh, boon is Indian English. When I go to England now and I talk about a boon, people don't know what I'm referring to in England. But it's all over the place here. So I've started using this word. I said it on the phone to my mom the other day. She's like, why are you talking like that? So there are, even the word here, boon, which I see a lot in this part of the world, does not occur in, in um England anymore. People are not sure what you would mean by that. They know curse because they do it a lot. Boon is quite foreign to them, which is nice in a way. So the different constraints as to whether it is indeed a boon or a curse. One of the things she talks about is conceptual constraints. When CLT and TBLT and possibly EMI conflicts with local values and misconceptions. There are values here at work. Classroom level constraints which if you have 100 students in a class and you have 50 minutes to teach them, that's 30 seconds per student. I don't know if you've ever tried to teach anybody anything in 30 seconds, but it's very difficult. <laughs> class size is, would be a classroom level constraint. Teacher-related factors, classroom management practices. So she had these two constraints. And then she talked about societal institutional level constraints. So I wanted us to bear these three constraints, even though it was in a different context about a different purpose. One of the things I do a lot in my work is to borrow from different fields and apply them to whichever field I'm in. So how you adapt and adopt within the local societal conceptual constraints. I've also done uh, work on what's known in the literature now as LEAP, which is learning English for examination purposes. In, in a number of countries, it's interesting because 
English is, is not a language. I went to Vietnam and Cambodia recently, and English, I would claim, is not a language there. Which is interesting. It says on the first slide, English is not a language, which is a good way to get discussion going, because people will say, as you're saying now, well, if English is not a language, then what is it? And in some of the countries I go to, you would never use English to communicate. You use English, you learn it for one reason, which is what? To pass the exam. So the language is stripped of its communicative intent. So when we think of English as a medium, now here in, in my experiences in India is that English is very much part of people's communication, especially uh, I enjoy hearing the code mixing and the code switching and the movements between uh, English and the various other local and national languages. So the whole purpose of English is different in different countries. In many countries, it has no communicative intent. It's just for the exam. So she concluded by saying, and this is a very important point I'd like to make before concluding, that teacher training and teacher education are absolutely essential if you're going to use a foreign or second language as a medium of instruction. A lot of the countries I go to are investing heavily in technology, lots and lots of ed tech. They are not investing in teacher training and development, and I'm telling them they're making a fiscal mistake because the technology doesn't teach anybody anything. It's just a tool. So before they go massively <coughs> investing in online technology in the hope that everybody will become fluent in English using the Internet, I advise they take 10% of their budget for technology and put it towards teacher training and development of the kind that the British Council does and many other organizations. Class size, as we've mentioned, is a huge factor. <coughs> and this difference between what the policy says and the actual practice. I spent many years in Hong Kong, um, which was a British colony, as you know, for 150 years. And it's interesting that, for the time being, I live in Canada, where the Queen of England is still on all of our money. So Canada is still very much a colonial country at this point, part of the so-called Commonwealth. So what the policies of the governments are and what the practices of the teachers are in classrooms can be very markedly different. And from my medical background, I've talked about contextual transplantation leading to rejection, like tissue rejection of an organ in a body. So I'm going to conclude there, as I did promise for 30 minutes. I believe that was about 30 minutes. And move now to what I think will be the more interesting, uh, lively, and interactive part of today's session, which is to hear from the panel and to hear from you. Thank you very much. There was a slide, Mr. Curtis, which talked of the language of this, language of that. Well, I thought I'd point out you missed out of one, although in explanation it was probably there. As a scientist, I feel it's a language of necessity more than anything else. Uh, and I'll explain this in a little bit. Um, you did also mention about that there's no particular age that is required to teach multilinguals. Uh, multiple languages, which would give a better result. Uh, I don't have the reference offhand, but neurobiologically they've determined the age before puberty to be the best, especially if you wanted to learn multiple languages. So that's a point to be considered, and I don't think it matters whether you learn one language extra, two language extra, the more the merrier, but it's that side of the brain which functions and develops along the developmental growth of the brain and learning of multiple languages is uh, coincidental. I would like to take two minutes, how much time do I have? Yes. Two minutes to tell you um, my experience as a scientist. So, of course, the major thing which Mrs. Sen, the most important part of my biodata which she did not tell you, is that I studied in modern high school 
and Mrs. Sen made this terrible error. And Sorry. it's important to know why I'm bringing that into context, apart from the righteousness of it, of course, um, is that we never thought, because right from kindergarten we were exposed to English, we learned two languages at home, and in school there was a third language which was taught, which was Sanskrit, etc. So we actually learned four languages simultaneously. However, it was clear that whatever we would do for our higher studies, it would be in English, and none of us questioned it or were not even asked at home. It was by um, affirmative decision that our family sent us to an English medium school. So till I became an adult, it didn't occur to me that there was an option, right? Now, the problem came up when I became an instructor, a scientist, a researcher, and my first student who came to me came from rural Bengal, and he just looked at me completely surprised as to why was I telling him that uh, he needed to take some coaching classes in English. And I was equally surprised why he didn't get it. Both of us were at two ends of the pole. And he then told me very, very um, outraged that he had got more than 75% marks in English. So who was I to say that he didn't understand? So I went back to the demography of it. And because I faced this over and over again in the 25 years that I worked in Bose Institute, because slowly the demography of students who came to do science changed from English medium school students to students from the villages. And so the language instruction and profession that is chosen changed over my life, uh, my work life. When we started our careers, in the eighth grade in modern high school, there was an aptitude test that was taken to see if whether we could qualify to study science or not. And one of the prerequisites that the then headmistress had put in, that those who wanted to study English needed to have high marks in, I'm sorry, those who wanted to study science needed to have high marks in English. All these I saw in front of my eyes change as I became a scientist and started to teach students. So I never taught in a classroom, but I had to deal with students every single day, every single minute in my laboratory. And what we found was, I must say, my best student never studied English. He, as a scientist, is outstanding. But he struggled. When did he struggle? And that's the problem of our profession, that we have to be internationally competitive. Having said that, I'm going to confuse you a little more. This is a problem for the colonial, post-colonial countries. The French and the Germans didn't face this problem. They taught science in their language. They went ahead and did their PhDs, postdocs, everything. But the moment they came to America, it was a challenge. Or the moment they went to England, it was a challenge. I'm married to a man who studied science in Hindi. And he went to the premier institute called IIT in India. And I just stared at him when I first met him. How on earth did you manage? How do you know? But clearly, the concepts were fine. Then he learned the English language through some thrillers. <laughs> and that was it. He made it. A very famous scientist whose uh, profile came out recently, a young man who works at the University of San Diego, and I remember meeting him and interviewing him for the Wellcome Trust, and he said, you know, my major fear was to face the visa interview uh, officer. I didn't have a problem understanding or getting into a postdoc position. So he used to hear all the Frank Sinatra songs, the country songs. He used to hear the thrillers uh, on, the move, on the television and then learn, up, learn how to say the English. He said this word, say the English, not speak it. Okay? Once he got in there, today he's been covered by econ uh, the Economist and the Times of in uh, and the t uh, I'm sorry, and Time because of his amazing discovery, which I don't want to elaborate here. So yes, the confusion between language and not language, literature, re requirement of English. I would like to summarize it to say the average person needs English. No, no, no insult meant, but the average mass of people need to have English as a language to survive in an international arena.
They also need more than in an international arena to survive in India. They need English. Because we are separated by states, we are separated by state languages. So it's important to know the state language. How many languages am I going to hear? We know how many official languages are there. To talk to somebody in Hyderabad or in Tamil Nadu, a person from Bengal needs to know English. So there are needs and there are compulsions. I don't know how much of it is really as perceived that English medium instruction is important or unimportant. I am not, again, like Mr. Curtis, I'm taking a back foot, and I'm not a contributor to the notion or against it. But that it is a part of our lives, and it's a part of lives of many people, and many people live without it, also exists in the world. And I really don't, the only place I'll really contradict Mr. Curtis is, I don't think numbers matter. I really don't think numbers matter. Every single individual matters. So even if one person is not affected by English as a medium of instruction, he's making a point. And if every second person needs it, that's important too. For the average Indian, English is needed to survive. The brilliant person, no matter what language they know, they can do it. But the average need English. Being a, being a TGT English, and also teaching classes of 11 and 12, what I have seen is students coming from science, actually those who are uh, taking science as their stream, they have given English at a back seat because they give more emphasis, I mean they more uh, emphasize on their uh, chosen subjects and for them for an example when I come to teach them my grandmother at 66, what they say is ma'am, so this is what they comment and uh, they actually, uh, I mean the way they look at English, I, told, I can't accept it as an English teacher. So for them, English has become a backseat for them. I mean, so we have to do a lot to motivate and cultivate English in them. As a fellow scientist, I've always liked Einstein's quote, which is um, that anybody can come up with an answer but it can take a lifetime to find the right question. So I'm much more interested in questions than answers. But my answer to this particular question, English medium instruction, boon or curse, would be yes and no, and it depends. So those would be my three answers to the question of uh, whether it's a boon or a curse. Um, in terms of, I also liked very much your comment about need. Uh, because I think if English is necessary, then EMI is a tremendous boon. If it's not, then it's a painful curse. So I think the necessity of English is, um, it does depend a lot on what people want to do. That, that's certainly the case. I, do, I meet a lot of young learners who are in villages in China, and it's very, very unlikely that they're ever in their life going to meet another native speaker. And very unlikely that they will ever in their life need to communicate in English beyond passing the national exam. So their needs are very different from the needs of students often in, in other situations. So when I talk to school-aged learners, and I talk in schools, and some of them say, oh, well, we don't really like English. It's very difficult. I say, that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to have it. Tell me about the kind of life you want. And then they tell me about the sort of life they want. And in all cases, the kind of life that they want requires English <laughs> because they want to go here or go there or do this or do that. But if they say, I never want to leave the village, I say, well, then you don't need to bother with English. It depends on what you want to do. And it depends on the needs that come out of that as to whether English is therefore a boon or a curse. A boon, if you want it and need it. A curse, if not. I was in Ahmedabad for about four years. And uh, I had a parent come to me and he wanted two of his children, his daughter, to study in the English medium school and his son to study in the Gujarati medium school. And when I asked them why, so the father said, my community, all girls have to get married to somebody in the US. 
so she has to be prepared for that and she has to speak english whereas my son if i invest all this money in teaching him in an english medium school um, he will not be accepted by the community and he will not be able to run my business well yes. now this english medium instruction has been described as a galloping phenomenon i read it somewhere and irrespective of all these debates and things we have i think it is here to stay and you see this liking and not liking and so on it will carry on forever and ever but it will be there now um uh, professor lohia has added english as a medium of uh, necessity the other two were uh, professor curtis you had said medium of inclusion and medium of intrusion now i wanted wondered whether we thought of exclusion and i thought that i would tell you first that i think i'm the oldest person in this room and i joined school uh, i was in school in the early 50s so i can describe to you what happened in you know the years immediately after the independence you see we studied the history of the british empire the characters that we grew up with were da- sally dick and rover we were familiar with daffodils and swallows and nightingales and what happened was that we learned to speak english in a special way and this word exclusion comes to mind because i remember that we used to uh, be amused by a different way of pronunciation and that's what i call the great divide and i remember this joke even i'm sure you've heard it what is common between shakespeare and a peacock do you know both are national birds <laughs> you see this is a uh, bengali speaking people they um, tend to say this and we would all laugh about uh, you know uh, bed sheets uh, because the long vowel and the short vowel would be mixed up uh, how it would be pronounced and beech trees and so on etc etc but it's only when i went to college that we realized about substance and people from bengali medium schools their um, knowledge of english was extremely sound and they wrote very very well somewhat ornamental and that idiomatic expression was not like ours but extremely sound and you know some of our greatest scholars are from bengali medium schools i can name them even you know uh, nirod choudhury amar tusen and so on so i learned that much later in life and what is happening today is that as professor curtis said younger and younger children are now going to english medium schools private schools and they are being forced to learn english when they come in parents are very very anxious because they feel that if they don't speak english fluently they will not get admission and it is very sad in a way and what happens is later the opposite happens see they go to these schools and they can't even speak their mother tongue properly and that conflict what will the children do first you scold them or you make them speak english all the time and next you scold them for not being able to uh, use their mother tongue properly now i wonder if you have uh, read a book called becoming indian by pavan verma you must have come across many articles even chetan bhagat had an article about this because the recent csat test that has triggered off a series of debates you know and this the adjective used was very interesting simmering debates and uh, pavan verma in fact this particular chapter was called macaulay's legacy and he says that people who have um 
come through these English medium schools, so-called English medium schools, he said, they can't even translate the national anthem, they can't speak two sentences without speaking English, and so on. Although it's, we find it interesting, we have our own language and we pepper it with uh, different words from different languages, but he had something to say, and you always have purists among us. Either you speak in English or you speak in Bengali or in Hindi or whatever. And in fact, he spoke about this, and I put it down because it seems so interesting. Um, according to a survey, 70% of words in a particular Hindi news channel are in English. Now I'm reading this. India ko apne strategic priorities or ambitions ke context mein neighboring countries se negotiations karne hongi. So we are wondering what it's all about. And I remember my own professor saying, I don't know what's come over people. Um, this lady of the house said, you know, young girl said, um, why don't you serve the bakis of yesterday's dinner? Now, baki, leftovers. <laughs> you know, even in our examinations, what they do is that they do not penalize a candidate for wrong English. It's the content. And we often, you know, have these long arguments about this. And we say internally in school we would continue to penalize them, otherwise they'll never learn. And, uh, you know, regarding this principled code switching, uh, Professor Curtis, that you were talking about, you see, when I taught um, for a very short spell in a Bengali medium school called Komola Bidda Mundir after I left school for a couple of months when we were waiting for our exam results. And I found that I was teaching, I was taking up a bilingual approach. Nobody had taught me. And I thought I could teach them better because it was a Bengali medium school. And mind you, when I was teaching in La Martinier, uh, for a spell, I was filling in for my own teacher. They said, you spe uh, teach class one and two Bengali. And I found that, that for that too, I was adopting a bilingual approach. I used English in my class too. So the, even today, the schools are taking different kinds of approaches. In some schools, they don't allow, English medium schools, they don't allow uh, students to speak in, Eng in uh, their own Hindi or Bengali, whatever. But in other schools, they say it's perfectly all right. You communicate as long as you don't do it inside the classroom because then you don't uh, develop that. You see, they also have to respect their own uh, mother tongue. And definitely it is limiting because I find that even teachers, even adults and students, Sometimes they aren't able to explain concepts or express themselves clearly uh, when they use English. A question to, you prefer questions, right? I would, I would like to ask you, um, is Hindi a supra-regional language? Because you said, said every other person is either a, an Indian or a Chinese or African. But Hindi, although it's spoken by so many, I want to know whether it's considered a supra-regional language. Boon in the dictionary, or have we made it up? Indians have made it up. Okay. The other thing is timing. You talked about timing. What do you think? Professor Lohia said pre-puberty. Do you have an opinion? And we need an answer, Professor <laughs> Curtis, for that. So I want you to speak about Gandhiji, there's a very beautiful uh, quotation, I can't remember the exact words, where he says that we need, we don't want to close our doors and windows. We must keep them open so that the winds of, you know, all the countries could come, but we shouldn't be swept off our feet by any one of them. That is really nice. And I thought that this was the way I'd like to feel that... Um, Definitely I'll go for English, but definitely we would like to preserve our identity. We would love to speak, and not only correctly, but elegantly in all the languages that we know. I would say, to answer your last, one of your latter questions first, and to 
be uh, pinned down a little by the question, English medium instruction, Boone or Kirst? First, Boone, one of the things that I like a lot about Indian English is that it is far more elegant and erudite and literary than the English on the streets of England that I hear. Because words like boon, and many of these words uh, came because of the colonial civil service language. They come uh, having spent uh, time in Hong Kong and, and uh, a number of colonies and now living in an ongoing colony as Canada. Uh, boon um, was not... Uh, uh, made up, but <laughs> it did come, and it was in common use during military and naval language. And as England's military and naval capabilities have declined, so has the use of naval language. But here, the, it's, there is no association with the word boon as a military or naval. It's just a very useful word. And so when I read uh, the Times of India and uh, English language newspapers, I have to read them several times. <laughs> of all the many, many different Englishes in the world I hear today, Indian English, as she is spoke today in India, is already, in my own personal and humble experience and opinion, already one of the most elegant of any Englishes I've ever heard. So no, no worries there. <laughs> um, the question, I think, is the development of my answer is that at the tertiary level... At the university or college level, EMI can be, has the potential to be a tremendous boon at that level. At the primary and elementary and young learner level, EMI has the potential to be a terrible curse. That's why age is so important. As to the question of critical period hypothesis, which I think is very important, critical period says that... Um, not specifically for language learning, interestingly, for sounding like an Englishman, not for learning language. All the research shows that age is not relevant to language learning. But to sound like the Queen of England, should you want to, I personally find that sound very disturbing. It is. But should you want to sound like that, that has to happen before the hormones kick in. So the only consistent research-based finding is that for native-like pronunciation... Critical period is important. But for mastering the language, no, not at all. Um, the last point I will make as a biologist, uh, because we were talking in the corner about um, code switching and code mixing and using of different languages, and a number of the countries I go to feel very strongly about uh, purity, uh, linguistically and culturally. And so for me as a biologist, I have learned the quickest way to kill a living thing. So let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what is the quickest way to kill a living thing? I started by my talk by talking about the qualities and characteristics of a living thing. Language is a living, breathing entity. Language classrooms is an organic, dynamic entity. What is the quickest way to kill a living thing? Biologically speaking, there is no more effective way to kill a living thing than to purify it. It is a biologically proven fact that if I, at the front here, produce a pure strain of any organism and the temperature of the room generates by even a fraction of a degree, it will die. Because in its purity, it has lost any adaptability. Purity is death at a fundamental cellular biological level. Diversity is strength not just as a political slogan, or the promotion of multilingualism, it is a biological fact of life that purity is death and diversity is strength. I do agree that English um, is important for us to march towards, you know, all that we aim in our lives. Like she said very rightly that no matter what we talk, how much we talk, it is there to stay. But what um, intrigues me is the fact that Countries like Taiwan, China, Japan, Korea, they follow a non-English path. And they are in a position which I think we should be very envious about. They are doing extremely well and I think they have really taken a very big leap forward. So what would the explanation for that be? Is it our north-south hostility in languages? Is it the north-south conflict in languages in our country which is responsible for this? One of the um, 
So to respond briefly, uh, and you're, you're quite right, as I travel around the world, uh, I, I am aware of these uh, huge differences. And one of the interesting things about the rise of English in China, and I've, I've just spent many months, uh, uh, and I have affiliations with a number of universities and work, in fact, with the British Council in Beijing there, and you, you talked about Hindi. What is the best language in the world? Forget EMI. Maybe. What is the best language in the world? Your own language, your own mother tongue. <laughs> <laughs> so you get answers like that over here. You don't get answers like that in English. People, the language of love or the language of the heart. Esperanto. Oh. Because nobody cares. Esperanto <coughs> is an artificially engineered perfect language and nobody cares. Because nobody was born Esperanto. Nobody, I assume you're familiar with the notion of Esperanto, which is a Latin-based, perfectly engineered language. Most people in the world don't know it, don't even know of it, even though it's a perfect language created by computer scientists. But nobody's interested because nobody has any feelings about it. Yeah. So, one of the things about English in China is nobody has any feelings about English in China. Interesting difference in Hong Kong, if you look at the language in Hong Kong. So, once you have a feeling about something, Hindi or English, once you have an emotional attachment, you're compromised in your response. Now, I spend my whole life becoming emotionally attached to things and people that I should not. So there are advantages to emotional attachment. You can ask my wife, but she'll be here later. But I think what English represents in a country like India is much more complicated, much more complicated than English as it's represented in China. In China, it's just for money. It's very clear cut. They're not interested in EMI or ESP or anything. They just want the money. It's English, we call it technically, when I'm in uh, Beijing or in the Shanghai School of Finance and Economics, it's called English for Business Purposes. That is a misnomer. It's English for give me your money. <laughs> very effective. So uh, uh, thank you for, for both of those questions. I think one of the differences I see in China and Taiwan and other countries with their English language learning. Firstly, and this is very important in China, the central government controls everybody. It's one of the linguistic limitations of a democracy. And India, as the world's largest democracy, with well over 1,650 documented languages, and I think about 16 official languages, it's very hard to centrally impose anything on a billion people in India. I think it's quite difficult to impose anything on a hundred people in India. But in China, you can impose something on a billion people. You can do that. And my wife is from Beijing, so I'm not, this is not racist. I'm not speaking out of turn. In China, you can impose anything on anybody, and it will apply to a billion people. Good luck with doing that in the world's largest democracy. <laughs> So I think there are democratic and political reasons, but in particular, there are reasons to do with uh, people just using English very dispassionately as a tool with a very specific purpose. And in India, the relationships are much more historical, political, emotional, and complicated. Thank you. You know, it is a, a comment on Professor Curtis's, uh, you know, what he said about wanting to learn the Queen's English, the way the Queen speaks. Now, is it true, excepting for those who want jobs at call centers, they have to develop a certain kind of accent to be understood. Do we care about accents now and diction and so on? Um, I'm asking you if you could answer very briefly. Very briefly? Um, yes. <laughs> because we'll never be able to sound like the Queen. I mean, we may be speaking correctly, we may be speaking beautifully, <laughs> so I could al I, uh, I also yes. want to object. Yes. I don't think <laughs> anything matters anymore. Ever since it, America became a global power, America's offering the jobs. It's got a million dialects working for it, mm -hmm. and the Queen's English doesn't matter anymore. We're all teachers here, I think, or 
we'll be becoming teachers or we are practicing teachers. And certainly, as teachers, we're not in it for the money. Are we? No. Um, and, um, I, d I disagree. I mean, I, I disagree that, it, that um, we are teaching English um, primarily for a better salary, a better job, but those things do exist. I think the bulk of our students in the British Council, they will come to us because they are either stuck in their career, they're perhaps 25 to 35, um, they've, um, they know that there is a promotion waiting, they should be in line for that promotion, but they're not getting it because English is one of those um, areas of their work which holds them back. And so they come to the British Council because they think that the British Council will be able to help them with their English, give them confidence. And with that confidence, they'll be able to present, they'll be able to sit for an interview, they'll be able to pass um, the interview and be promoted. The second main um, group of people that we tend to see are the younger crowd. I, I don't mean very young. I mean they're about in their late teens or early 20s. And they come to us at the beginning of their careers because perhaps they don't want to be 30, 35, 40 and in the position where they're not passing um, interviews. They're not being given promotions. So they're, they're realizing at a very early stage or an earlier stage than the other group that English for them is going to be important for their job. So yes, money is a factor. Um, English is a tool to advance a career. English is a way of moving up through society, up through an organization. Um, but I don't know if money is always the the motivation. Um, I think there are more there, there are deeper things going on in India that, than, than, than just that. Um, Professor Curtis, if that is your real name. Um, I too um, was born in the UK to um, Indian parents. Um, I think I'm called second generation. Um, I'm one of the few second generation Indians, I believe, in the UK who doesn't speak a second language. I mean, my mother's language. I only spoke English at home, even though my mother and my father, they spoke um, versions of northern Indian languages in the background. But to me and my sister, it was always in English. And... Up until I was perhaps 15 or 16, about the time when you did that census, um, I wasn't sure why I was only brought up having one language, where all my Indian friends at school and college were bilingual. Um, and I asked my parents, so tell me, what was the decision that you made that we would only be English speaking at home. And it harks back to what you said about language and power. Being an immigrant in a new country, you need every advantage that you can possibly get to make it, as you mentioned before, how many CVs were rejected and how many CVs were, um, were with English and only English, um, my parents thought this was the way of developing and moving forward in a, in, in a country where English was the language. And therefore they thought that English, the language, equaled power, it equaled opportunity. <coughs> so for, for that reason, it was a it was a boon. 
um, I was able to go to university. Like you, I did medicine and then came into education. Um, but now it's a curse because I cannot communicate in India. And how ridiculous is that? Um, it really is one of the saddest situations that I think you can put somebody in is to put them into a new country and they can't communicate. And so one of the things that the British Council tries to do with our students, and lo a lot of them do want to go overseas, the UK is a huge magnet. Um, Australia, Canada, the US even, it's a huge magnet. Um, I think in the US, I think Bengali is the 17th most spoken language in the US. So there are a lot of Bengalis there, over there. Um, um, so it, it is a language of power. It is a language of opportunity. And I, th and I just going back to our um, discussion about whether we choose to start English at an early le at an early age or a later age, um, I agree. I think students need at a very early age to be literate and numerate in their first language, in their mother language. They need to be in a school system and be familiar with what a school does. A school, it's. It teaches not only subjects, it teaches social skills as well. Um, a school is a place of education, and I think the first language needs to be the first language for the first couple of years. Once students become literate, numerate, confident, have a set of study skills that they can then apply to different languages, then we can gradually introduce um, different languages into the curriculum. Um, it creates diversity um, and I think diversity um, is probably not quite the opposite of purity but, it cr but by creating diversity you're creating strength. Language strength, um, opportunity strength and I think future strength and I think the, the language that we are, are all aware of and some of us are teaching, and I think we do provide opportunities for our learners. We provide a future for our learners, and I think that's the most important thing that we can offer them, is that future that one language perhaps doesn't offer them. Um, just one final point, and then I'll pass the... Um, uh, the questions back to the floor again, and that was about teacher, teachers and teacher education. Um, my first job in teaching um, was actually teacher training. I wasn't a teacher. I had no idea about um, the past simple, the present continuous, the third conditional. My students, however, they, they were Vietnamese, actually. They were v Vietnamese students. Um, they knew very well that the past simple was a grammatical structure that you used to describe an activity that has finished. You all know that, don't you? I didn't know that as a, as a, as a native speaker of English. And so I gradually became a teacher from my students. Um, they taught me grammar because I didn't learn grammar um, at, at school. Um, but working with teachers, it's such an amazing, enriching experience because I think in no other profession are we so proud of what we can do and what we can achieve and I think the opportunities that we can offer our, our, our students um, I don't think there are many, many other professions out there that do what we do um, creating opportunity, building diversity 
allowing for a future to develop? Firstly, as a brother and kindred spirit, I would reinforce pretty much everything you said uh, with the qualification at the beginning. Mm. If you come from medicine, you know uh, that moving from medicine to language teaching is uh, economically a disaster. And people have said to me, you know, why did you become an English teacher when you were a medical specialist? And I've said, uh, for the money and the glamour. <laughs> and they've like, oh, he's British, he's being funny. Okay. So it took me, I actually ran the numbers, because I do a lot of financial work, and it took me more than five <laughs> years as a language teacher to get anywhere near to what I made as a medical specialist in a year. So I teach it for the love of it. My students learn it for the money. So there's a very important difference. We may teach it for the love of it, and God knows we don't teach it for the money or the glamour. Um, but a lot of my students, and more and more of them, learn it with a very specific purpose for income, for opportunity, as you said. So that's a, a point that I wanted to bring out because I think that is an important one. Uh, I, I left medicine and, and went to language teaching because I didn't love medical science. And I know it sounds strange, but looking back on 10 years in medical science and 20 years as a language teacher, I truly believe I have saved more lives as a language teacher than I did as a hospital worker any day of the week. If you talk about positive impact, no comparison. No comparison. So I have no regrets. My parents had huge regrets. Um, as poor immigrants from South America, uh, they never came to any of my graduation ceremonies. My dad, till his dying day, didn't. My mom, when I got my PhD and could say, my son, the doctor, finally <laughs> came and... I was explaining to her uh, the difference between a PhD and a medical degree, which she now understands, or she understood at that time. So she still introduces me now as, this is my son who's a doctor, but not the kind who helps people, which I thought was very nice. So um, the, the point of, of purpose and, and reason, I think, is very important. And what you said about... Uh, your own disconnect in a way. They're finding this a lot with the Spanish-speaking population in the US. Mexican mothers are forbidding their children to speak Spanish. And this is leading to a breakdown of the family because their grandparents and grandchildren can't communicate. Now let me ask you, in a country like India, what would happen to Indian society if tomorrow none of the grandchildren could communicate with any of the grandparents? India would implode, would it not? So... We do need to look at age very carefully, and we do need to look at how we stay connected with our origins and our language and our culture. And I, too, had to formally learn English as a scientist. I grew up in England at the same time, and my German students could tell me exactly where and what and why there was a split infinitive. I had to go look it up. So, <laughs> so we, when we talk about native and non-native, if you were born and raised in England at the time we were, when it comes to the structure, the meta-language of English, we're pretty much natives, non-natives. We had to learn that stuff. <laughs> so I would wholeheartedly endorse all of your points across the board, ex except for making that distinction that I do it for love. I teach for love, but my students learn it for anything but. For love, they do other things. Would uh, uh, Professor Curtis really agree that uh, the situation of English learners in India and the situation of uh, Spanish-speaking people in, um, say, California or even in Mexico comparable? Because even if Indian ch uh, children go to an English medium school, uh, from a very early age, they'll have the vernacular language in their ears all around them. So there will never be a question of forgetting the language or losing a total proficiency in the language. And because English will, they will they, they'll never be totally exposed to an atmosphere of English language uh, the earlier they are introduced to it in uh, schools, the better for them because they, they get very little exposure to the language otherwise. Have you visited uh, Indian government schools or seen how English is taught? 
I find there is an overdose of grammar which the children do not take at all. Uh, I went to a school which taught in Bengali up to class 7 and then switched to English. And when all through, you know, from kindergarten to class 7, we knew at one stage we had to study in English. So we had to learn the language, but we learned it only as a language. We didn't do any of our subjects because our medium of instruction was Bangla. But when we switched over to English, we didn't, we ne it was difficult, it's not that it was very easy, but it wasn't impossible. Later when I went to college at Presidency, there were many students in my class who came from a completely Bangla medium. And what I found was their scientific bent of mind was much better than ours and their inquiring minds were also much better. Maybe for the students who went from an English medium background, their oral skills were better, but their written skills were not bad. And over a period of time, we all adjusted to the language. So I don't think, you know, switching from one language, even if we do Bangla at the primary level and secondary level, and then, or a re any other regional language, even if it is very grammar-based, uh, English that we learn, but switching to English is not really always that difficult as a medium of instruction. I don't think it is a language which makes you a better scientist or a better literateur, no. Okay. I think language does make you a better student, though. Um, because um, I, I can't quote anyone, um, but I do know, and I have read, so you'll have to take my word for it, um, that by having a second or a third language at school, it ups the cognitive ability of that particular student. Um, and being more cognitive makes you perhaps more scientific, more able to appreciate science. I just want to say that uh, we do need to learn English in a globalized world. That's what I said. And also we need to uh, keep up our own languages. And I think speaking for Bengali, it is one of the richest languages. Unfortunately, it doesn't go beyond the region. But we shouldn't lose those things. We have to keep our identity, we have to keep our languages, but we need to learn English, that's all. A great man who has recently left us, uh, Nelson Mandela, said, if you speak to a person um, in a second language, a second language that he understands, he will understand it. And that message will go to his head. I mean, he will, he will be able to um, play with the language at a mental level. But when you speak to someone um, in his or her own first language, that message bypasses the head and goes straight to the heart. So that's what you have just said. I think it's very true that the first language, be it Bengali, Spanish, Chinese, is the language that we always promote. A second language is one that we also offer. As we were taught, in conclusion, uh, it's good to... That, that quote from Nelson Mandela, I, I like very much, that if you speak... He, he said man, actually, but... If you speak to a man um, in a first language, you will speak to his heart. If you speak to him in a second language, you will speak to his head. And I, I think that's very true. Just to touch on some of the recurring themes, uh, age uh, clearly is, is a very important factor. Uh, teacher training, teacher development. The relationship between language and uh, thought is also extremely important. And... One of the phrases that's come up in, in my work is first languages first. First languages first, second languages 
later. The question about government schools, thank you, because I, I, am, I am about to uh, pester the British Council very much over dinner to, to get into schools and actually see what is, is happening in schools. So I, I'm making that more of a mission of mine as I travel around the world. You mentioned grammar and grammatical competence, and grammatical competence is important uh, for exams, and it's important when it interferes with communicative competence. But the notion of, uh, of uh, grammatical competence as the end in itself, I agree, is a, is a problematic notion. They've had similar things in China with uh, hundreds of millions of young people have had 16 years of grammar and they can't understand a word I'm saying now. Not a word of it. Not, forget responding, they don't even get what I'm saying. So we know the limits of grammatical competence for sure. And then communicative competence and now cultural competence. So this idea of first language is first, second language is later is, is one of my concluding points. I would also say that there is no one particular language that is better for critical thinking. Uh, the only theory I've heard is um, that German is best for philosophy. Because in German, if any of you know German, you can put many, many words together in German and create these massive words that basically mean existential angst of being. And you can do that in German. That's why some people have said somewhat seriously that that's why philosophy is Germanic in its most angst-ridden and beautiful sense, because German allows you to push all these words, chop them up and put them together. Um, so to, to conclude with notions of linguistic creativity, to echo some of the comments of the panel, the more languages we have, the more we are. It's that simple. If we have one language, we're one person with one set of frames of reference. I know students who have nine languages. English is their ninth language. And I have to tell you, to hear them speak is something to behold. To have one person conceive of the world in nine different ways Wonderful. is extraordinary. So first language is first, second language is later, but more languages, more person. Thank you. Thank you. To all the panelists and to Professor Andy Curtis. I think I'm beginning to get a sense of the answer to the question, boon or curse. I think the panel and uh, members of the audience are very much tilted towards boon, but uh, Andy has still not taken a position. He's in between, yeah? <laughs> and uh, that's what it is, and uh, Andy's here, as he'll discover, and he, as probably, of course, he knows much better being in the English uh, language teaching context that India is complex, and uh, that's why we would still consider it uh, to be a boon. And uh, we are like that only. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. If it is a curse now, with the help of agencies like the British Council, it could become a boom. So I actually believe that it can be made from one into the other. Uh, I, I do strongly believe, and I think there's a lot of evidence that says, even if you look at a situation and EMI is at that point a kind of a curse, it can be turned into over time. It takes time and a lot of effort. But I, I believe that if it is, a kind of curse here, it can be into a kind of boom over time with a lot of effort and resources. The question of culture is a very important one, and the relationships between language and culture, of course, are equally important. For me, the answer to your question relates to a distinction that was not on the slide, but it's been established in the literature for a long time, which is the difference between what's called additive bilingualism and subtractive bilingualism. In subtractive bilingualism, the mother tongue is forcibly replaced with another language. Now, this has happened in certain cultures. For example, in Canada, where we live, the First Nations people were taken, the children were taken from their schools and, and deprived of their mother tongue and forced to speak English. Also in Australia, Aboriginal children were taken from their parents, put into English schools, and deprived any access to their mother tongue. That doesn't really happen today, I'm glad to say. 
But I would say that I, although I understand people's concerns about culture, if we look at our son, uh, he is Chinese and English. He's very Chinese in certain areas, things like food, but when it comes to sport, he's very Canadian. So, on a very personal level, as a parent, not just as a teacher, I think that the more languages and the more cultures we have, the more human we are. So, given that globalization is here to stay, uh, the more, I, I met a student of mine recently who has nearly nine languages. Nine languages, and when they talk about anything, I love to listen because they talk about anything from so many different perspectives because language is giving them access to other cultures. So my, my answer would be yes, uh, first languages and first cultures must be preserved, but they must also adapt and change and grow because we have chosen as a society to follow the path of globalization. I think uh, an argument for English in India is not an argument against other languages. I think many of us, and I think the vast majority of us, grow up in India as perfect bilinguals, in many cases trilinguals, and in some cases perfect multilinguals. I mentioned fleetingly that I was born and brought up in Bihar, well, that is now in Dhaka. So my home language notionally was Bangla. The language outside was Hindi. And my first language all through in school was Hindi. And English was there around me. My parents encouraged me to learn English. And eventually the transition to English was reasonably painless because of the two other languages I had. And I think uh, there's very strong empirical data now which shows that this is also true in terms of very rich scientific evidence. Last year, uh, British Council actually in partnership with Pratham Asar Center, and I'm very glad that the Pratham colleagues here, we analyzed the Pratham English language learning outcomes data that Pratham Asar Center had collected historically from 2007 to 2012 from across every rural district in India. That's a huge data set. And there were two very, very important conclusions we could draw. One was that children who, had, who were doing in the Prathamasar survey better in their mother tongues were also doing better in English. Whether that's a causal correlation, we don't know. Because the uh, Asar data collection mechanism is not set up in a way for us to establish a causal link. But there was a distinct correlation. The other very interesting uh, correlation was that children who were eligible in primary classrooms, and as we know from our own experience, especially in the state sector, in primary classrooms, we tend to have uh, children from a fairly uh, wide variety of ranges in, in a particular classroom, we tend to have multi-grade classrooms, etc. Children who were eligible were doing better in English in the Pratham survey. And that is possibly because, not certainly, possibly because they were also better in the mother tongues. So I think that is something that we need to acknowledge uh, quite robustly when we talk in terms of policy and practice uh, around not just English but across any language. And there is, I think, um, as, as someone who is very passionate about my two other languages, uh, I love my Bengali literature, I love reading Hindi literature, and I've always done so. As someone who is very passionate about other languages, I, and someone who is involved in language education in some way, I really, really despair about the state of our vernacular and bhasha education across India. What is the state, how is Hindi being taught in uh, Bihar, for instance? How is Bangla being taught in West Bengal? The scenario is pretty great. I think there is a larger crisis around language teaching across India and I think that has a lot to do with the pressures of globalization as well. There is this broad perception that if you are good in maths, if you are good in science, if you are good in IT, you will crack the 
entrance exams, you'll get into medicine, you'll get into engineering, or you will get into civil services, whatever. But because the role of language in knowledge acquisition is, I think, in terms of perception that is shrinking in India, and I think that is a real civilizational crisis. Not to take our languages seriously is, is the problem. It is not a question of whether it's English or Hindi or Bangla or Maithili. All these languages are very important. If we encourage our children to do well in these languages, I think we will have solved the major part of the process. Let me first comment briefly on the research that's being done on what is called language death. There are, every day, as far as we know, languages becoming obsolete and extinct. And it was, for some years, thought that English was to blame for this, um, or possibly some other global languages. Now, the data is starting to show that these languages are falling into disrepair, not because of English, but because the young people in those communities don't share the same values. So there's an interesting cultural difference going on between the generations, but it does seem that English, uh, and David Gradle does actually mention this, but more recent research shows that in relation to some of your earlier points, that in a sense languages and cultures, first languages and first cultures, have nothing to fear from second and foreign and other languages and other cultures. So the, the data is starting to be quite conclusive that the languages that are dying off are not at all dying off because of English or globalization. So that's an important point. In terms of how to move from 1% to 100%, which is an excellent question, that, um, as I said, takes a, a lot of time. And I, I'm not sure I would say that 100% is even the goal. That's perhaps an important point. What I find, uh, especially in, in classrooms in this part of the world, is that teachers and students in certain classes are quite comfortable code switching and code mixing and moving between the two languages, or sometimes many languages, in a single class. And I find that very exciting and linguistically very creative. Some of my colleagues who are purists say you should either speak Hindi or speak English, or, but not to mix them. I, I actually disagree with them because I think uh, a bilingual, multilingual approach is really where India is and where it's going. I think if we get uh, anywhere past 50, we're doing well. A lot of um, governments that I work with are trying to use the technology to get from 1% to 100%. Firstly, as I said, 100% maybe isn't the goal. Once you're past 51%, that means the majority of the interaction in that classroom is in the target language at 51%. So moving across the continuum gradually, I think, is the answer, and not perhaps going for 100%. And the second point, which is made by the dysfunctioning of the microphones, is that it should be about more teachers and more teacher training, not about more technology. So my own position at this point is less technology, as you can see, and more teachers. And I think it's, again, an important distinction when we, when we talk about English medium of instruction. As you say, there are many different kinds of English. There's English for passing the exam. Uh, there's English for grammatical competence. There's English for communicative competence. And uh, your question touches on, on all of those things. And in many countries that we work in, uh, the country is trying to move from grammatical competence to communicative competence. And the short answer to, to the uh, big questions that you pose, how to bridge that gap, when I'm working with young learners in different countries, one of the things I do is to make use of popular culture. Uh, as I've been traveling around uh, different cities in India the last few days, I've noticed many, many uh, movie posters, posters for Indian films and the movie stars. And I see um, a number of uh, male movie stars advertising underwear, yes. which is uh, unique in India. So clearly, movies and movie stars and seeing in popular are huge here. They're a very powerful aspect of local languages and local cultures. So one of the ways that I have over the years bridged some of these types of English 
is to make use of popular culture, by which I mean music and film in particular. So if I'm working with students who, are, who really enjoy watching films in their first language, I'll use that motivation and use that enjoyment to introduce them to more authentic or more communicative versions through popular culture, depending on what they're interested in. So that would be just one set of approaches, but I, I think your point about bridging that gap is a very important one. I'd like to conclude by making a few observations, some of it which has already been covered, but I'll still touch upon them uh, for purposes of summarizing today's proceedings. I think uh, we are currently observing two very contrary scenarios in India when, in, when it comes to English language teaching, English medium instruction, these questions. One, there is a you know, indisputable groundswell of demand for English um, from the grassroots level, particularly from economically and socially backward communities. And, which is, and that is in turn exerting a huge amount of democratic and demographic pressure on policymakers to provide English, uh, better English to the uh, a wider section of the population. NCRT's data shows that 25 of India's 30 odd states teach English from class one. And this flies in the face of uh, international research on when in English should be introduced in countries like us. But I think the fact that 25 states introduce English in class one is a kind of response to this huge pressure from the electorate, from parents. Parents are people who vote, children don't vote. So I think we need to recognize that, uh, that particular political pressure that there is. Um, in fact, um, Pratham Asar is one report, and there is also the probe report, which uh, has been um, providing empirical evidence for over a number of years that English medium instruction or the perceptions around English medium instruction is one key reason why a large number of students are moving away from free government schools to fee paying so-called English medium private schools, um, not just in cities but also in semi-rural or completely uh, rural contexts. The, the contrary movement that's also happening, and I think this is, there is uh, very rich evidence that um, English is no guarantor of learning outcomes. And I think that uh, there has been research by a number of agencies, particularly the National Council of Applied Economic Research uh, Study, which showed that there is no perceptible difference in learning outcomes from, uh, for students coming from English medium instruction backgrounds and those coming from similar government schools where English is not the medium of instruction. So I think that needs to be acknowledged. And I mentioned our analysis of Pratham Asar data on English. Again, the correlation between uh, first language or home language and acquiring English is, is quite strong, and we need to build on that. I mentioned that an argument for English is not an argument against other languages, certainly not home language or other uh, Indian languages. I distinctly remember uh, you are Anantamurti, uh, our very revered author from Karnataka, Kannad author. He made a very interesting observation at one of uh, our own programs in London. He said he gave a very interesting spin to the three language idea that was propounded most famously by the Kothari Commission of 1966 in India. He said three languages need not be uh, distilled into you know, home language, uh, mother tongue, and then Hindi or, uh, or a South Indian language or Urdu, and then English. It can be a very flexible notion where there's the, home, the concept of the home language, the playground language, and the language of the marketplace. And this is a very flexible, I thought, paradigm where, you know, I mean, the language of the marketplace could also be Hindi for some people. It needn't necessarily be English. I mean, uh, and there is now, again, a lot of data emerging from businesses in India that this notion that English is the solution for corporate work, that's, that's not necessarily the case. I think there's also a huge demand for English because of the formal employment opportunities it offers. Um, it's difficult to uh, veer away from that uh, in, in a very artificial way. Um, David Gradle's research, which Andy cited several uh, times in his um, lecture, the, that infers that there are three major dri drivers for English in India. 
for education, especially higher education, uh, as we all know, the default mode of higher education in India seems to be English. There is no reason for it being so, but it, it happens to be the case. Employment, of course, and social mobility and mobility of, of all sorts. Um, I think there's also the context of many other countries, such as China, such as many countries in Latin America, trying to provide uh, better scope for English for these reasons for economic and social, um, economic development and for social mobility. I think there's also a very strong argument for a English to be called an Indian language as well. Um, there is very strong uh, data, again, David Gradle's first book called The Future of English, which he brought out towards the end of 1990, that demonstrated that over 70 to 75 percent of global English usage doesn't happen between native speakers. It happens between exclusively non-native speakers of English. So for the world to function, it needs English, and I think the uh, internet boom has really underscored that to a great degree. But again, there's very interesting movement there. Now, more and more, um, uh, you know, internet uh, transactions are happening through other languages, uh, I mean, languages other than English. There's also a very strong non-utilitarian argument for English. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the Indian historian Ramchandra Guha's uh, book, uh, Of Patriots and Partisans. There is a very interesting chapter called The Rise and the Fall of the Bilingual Intellectual in that uh, book. And uh, Ram Guha basically argues, I mean, he gives the case of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who had, of, of course, Gujarati was his mother tongue, Hindi he used very proficiently, and also because of his family background and his education in England, he had very good English. Without these three languages, Guha argues that Gandhi would not have access to global uh, knowledge and philosophical and political systems, which he eventually used to undermine um, the British Empire in India. So, uh, and very similar argument for many, many Indian uh, sort of icons. I mean, uh, Rabindranath Tagore is one such who was basically home taught in English, uh, homeschooled in English. Um, uh, Harivansh Rai Bachchan, the great Hindi poet, again, uh, he is, he was. Uh, professor of uh, English literature in Allahabad University. And there are many, many such instances. Prem Chandji was pretty proficient in uh, English himself. So, uh, and Urdu, of course. So I think there's a very strong case for uh, multilingualism. And there is also scientific evidence for multilingualism helping the cognitive ability of children. I mean, multilingual children are cognitively better. Uh, you spoke about that in Calcutta a little bit, Andy. And uh, there's also now clinical evidence that multilingualism uh, defers the onset of many age-related problems such as dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I think to end off, I would like to also argue that English has in many ways seeped into popular culture of India. Uh, we were talking about using uh, um, popular culture to introduce English concepts. Uh, Bollywood, I mean, what is the language that Bollywood uses? Is it Hindi? Is it English? Is it uh, Marathi? Is it Mumbai or Hindi? It's very difficult. I mean, watch a film like Three Idiots. I mean, I've had loads and loads of English colleagues who have watched Three Idiots without any subtitles. So, uh, there is also, I mean, Indi uh, India has managed to, you know, uh, almost colonize English in a, in a, in a very um, interesting way. Uh, and think about uh, uh, a big famous YouTube hit called Colavari D. Uh, it's got 82 million hits when I last checked a couple of days back. I mean, that song written in uh, a mishmash of Tamil and English, I mean, who are, we are the people who are listening to that song over and over again. And we are able to communicate with that simply because it uses a very clever, funny, humorous English. So I think uh, we need to acknowledge all these factors and um, then decide on which side of the debate we, um, we are on, uh, English medium instruction, boon or curse. Thank you very much.